Welcome everyone to the third work group meeting. Thanks for your patience in uh, me learning how to use Zoom webinar. Um, and um, I think we were going to start today with uh, a brief roll call, but I can and pretty much see everyone who's here. I'm gonna check the attendees list just to make sure if there's any more work group members that I need to promote, which I don't see any right now. Um, and um, we do have new members joining us today from the Planning Commission because there was a um, change in assignments. And um, uh, Mr. Bauke, would you like to just say a few words since you're sure. here today? Uh, first off, I look forward to working with everybody on, on this project. It's to me, to me, it's a very important uh, project that the city has undertaken here with what's going on at the state legislature and knowing that Santa Barbara's had a very, very long history of design review and architectural review, which has protected the community and created it as a special place. And the state's making that harder and harder to do. And so this is one of the ways that the city, I honestly believe, can protect its special character we got to do it right and so that's um my, my sort of overall arching guy i actually asked to be on this committee uh the current chair is running for state assembly so he wanted to offload something so this is what he decided to offload uh for those of you that are in this group that i don't know some of you i know of there are the folks at opticos i've worked with in multiple uh settings as their client or as a colleague or as a consultant to them for the last 20 some years so know these guys well they do good work and i'm definitely here to be an objective critical person <laughs> of their work as we go through this so uh, so my background is i've been in the planning profession for 40 years uh in both the public and private sector, both as a consultant and as a representative of a major landowner in California. So that's my background. Uh, I proposed the first uh, form-based code for a master development in California in uh, 1999. Uh, so I've been very, very active in form-based codes and objective design standards, such as what we're discussing for well over 20 years. So. That said, I don't want to talk about myself much, so <laughs> thank you for the opportunity, though. Well, thanks for joining us, and we look forward to uh, your participation. And um, I did send, um, you know, some of the past materials that we went through. And and did you do the um, the tour? You were I have the only part I have. I've watched both of your prior uh, meetings, and I've read all the the physical hard material, and I've been to couple of sites, but I have not done the tour. So that's where I'm at, I'm trying to catch up. Great. All right. Um, so yeah, the rest of the meeting, I'm going to turn over um, to Opticos. We're going to talk about um, the existing conditions memo, give you time to ask questions. And um, they'll be talking about our architectural styles strategy. Um, so let's see, do I need to give screen share or are you set up to be able to yes. go into the PowerPoint? Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen and then Stefan and Eric are going to present. Okay, and I'll ask everyone um, during the presentation to go ahead and mute your microphones just so we don't get background noise. And then um, if you want to ask questions, of course, you can unmute. Oh, it says you have disabled screen sharing. Okay, I'll try to fix that. Hang on. Okay, do you have it now? Are you guys seeing the screen, the agenda? Uh, yes, we are. Thank you. OK, so I'll move on to the next slide then. Here 
you're see, seeing if you want to go back to the previous slide just for a sec. That would be great. Thank you. So Rosie, I just wanted to confirm, do we need to complete the roll call for the meeting purposes? John had an opportunity to introduce himself, but do we need to? Um, no, I don't think this meeting good. isn't so formal that we need to do Great. a roll call. I think we're good. Okay, we can cross one item off the list. So, <laughs> um, so just this is an overview of what we have prepared to speak with you about today. Um, as you know, the existing conditions memo was completed um, and submitted uh, uh, to staff. I'll provide sort of a brief overview of that material and what it covers. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about specifically the uh, strategy that we are considering uh, for architectural style uh, within uh, the applicable project area. Um, and I'll talk about that sort of uh, in the context of the, the map of the city and then sort of uh, provide some information about the individual architectural styles that are under consideration. Um, then I'm gonna sort of uh, talk briefly uh, to remind you about sort of where we are with, with regards to the project schedule and uh, what we have with regards to upcoming meetings. Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity uh, to hear from uh, members of the community that have joined us. Um, on the call. Thank you, Sting. Go to the next slide, please. So, uh, just a little bit sort of about the main topics that are included in the existing conditions memo, a little bit about sort of neighborhood physical character. Uh, this includes uh, built patterns in the neighborhoods that we looked at and analyzed. Um, as well as the standards and implications of the existing zoning. Uh, and then uh, there's a, a introductory discussion to sort of architectural style, which will sort of continue um, in the meeting today. Next slide, please. So um, the existing conditions memo looked at sort of a variety of neighborhood characteristics and sort of providing an analysis of, uh, 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 of existing conditions. Uh, we looked at sort of uh, general contexts, uh, whether sort of the, uh, the neighborhoods within the project area were what we refer to as sort of walkable or, uh, or auto-oriented in nature. Um, we uh, looked at the existing topography um, as well as sort of the uh, existing uh, zone districts that apply. Uh, we looked at sort of the streetscape conditions. This includes sort of both the um, public and private frontage conditions, uh, what sort of the edge of the streetscape is like and how the buildings transition uh, behind the back of the sidewalk. Uh, we looked at sort of sidewalk types and dimensions. Uh, we generally looked at sort of uh, the condition of lots, uh, the sort of prevalent lot widths and lot depths in different neighborhoods, um, uh, the number uh, of units that are sort of typical to sort of uh, lots, as well as sort of how parking is handled, uh, both sort of the type of parking surface versus uh, a, a podium or structure and where it tends to be located uh, on the lot. And then we also sort of looked at sort of the built character and that includes sort of the number of buildings on given parcels, uh, the, the types of buildings um, that are used in development um, and the scale and height um, of buildings uh, that are sort of prevalent. Next slide, please. Um, within the existing conditions memo, uh, we also looked at a, a variety of sites to try to understand the difference between the zoning envelope that's actually granted uh, within uh, the, the, the zoning regulations and the resulting envelope that actually emerges from the approved project. So we looked at five different sites across uh, different neighborhoods. We tried to sort of include uh, different conditions uh, and uh, the presence of architectural styles um, in these proposals. And it, this was sort of a very sort of instructive um, uh, uh, process for us to sort of understand again sort of the difference between the, the sort of by right zoning envelope and sort of what the outcome typically is um, uh, when um, when the project has sort of completed 
uh, the discretionary review process. Of course, we're sort of thinking about this and doing this process to try to understand what additional standards need to be imposed or should be imposed or could be imposed uh, in the absence of this discretionary review to sort of make sure that these projects are sort of right-sized um, uh, and uh, sort of are appropriately responding uh, to the context within the neighborhoods. And then there's a little bit of discussion about architectural style. We sort of looked at a neighborhood atlas that sort of looked at the prevalence of existing architectural styles uh, within the neighborhoods. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the slide sort of moving forward. Um, but sort of some key things that we sort of want to think about here are um, uh, architectural style as it relates to building form. And uh, we refer to this uh, sort of broadly when we think about sort of block scale buildings versus house scale buildings. Uh, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that um, in the upcoming slides. Uh, we're thinking about that in the context of building footprint, uh, where in some neighborhoods we have sort of a fairly fine grain that's present. Uh, while in sort of the more core neighborhoods, we actually have uh, buildings that are quite large um, or, or could potentially be quite large. And uh, how this sort of relates to the geography of the city. Uh, so we started internally referring to that geography <laughs> as a donut, which I will sort of describe sort of in the upcoming slides. Um, uh, depending on your sort of <laughs> preference for pastry, it's not really a donut, but you'll see sort of what we mean when we sort of talk about that geography. Go to the next slide, please. So um, this is sort of, uh, this map sort of provides uh, the sort of the general context where we uh, expect the objective design standards to apply. And you can see sort of that what's contrasted here between sort of the broader project area, uh, which includes sort of all of the core neighborhoods all the way up through sort of the upper state area uh, uh, to La Cumbre, um, as well as sort of the EPV uh, within the core. And um, this is sort of what we started to refer to as the donut, sort of thinking about the broader project area as the donut and the EPV as sort of the whole or sort of the center of that donut. Um, this is sort of helpful for us to think about. And of course, sort of in this context, we understand too that within the EPV, uh, it's the it's the HLC which is the is, is the primary review body for projects, while within sort of the broader project area, uh, we're focusing on the discretionary review uh, that is done by uh, the ABR. So this is sort of important context for us to sort of think about when we're trying to think about sort of architectural styles, but also how we might start to think about how we apply objective design standards. Go to the next slide, please. So the zoning ordinance actually provides a good bit of background with regards to uh, the architectural styles, which are both prevalent uh, within different parts of the city and also sort of are expected uh, within new development. Those are defined uh, most clearly uh, within the EPV, and you know there are sort of listed sort of five related uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish revival styles uh, within the EPV. Those include California Adobe, Mission Revival, Spanish Colonial Revival, Monterey, and Italian Mediterranean. Some of those styles like California Adobe are sort of specific to historic structures that exist within the EPV, while others actually have sort of have a presence that basically includes both historic buildings, but sort of continues to be applied to new buildings. Um, and I think that's sort of an important consideration. Um, there are also a sort of uh, other areas of the city, in particular Brinkerhof uh, and the, the Lower Riviera Special Design District where um, there is specific mention and documentation of architectural styles. And we sort of looked at those carefully. Um, there are sort of uh, interesting cases in sort of both of those geographies, for example, in Brinkerhof, almost all the existing structures have already been designated as structures of merit. And so this is a situation where new development is, would be dri driven by alterations and additions to existing structures, as opposed to new development that needs to be compatible. Um, but there is sort of a, um, a, a framework of styles, including Italian uh, the East Lake or stick style, the prevalence of Queen Anne and sort of a subset of that Queen Anne free classic, as well as sort of craftsmen. 
Um, and some of these we sort of are sort of moving forward to sort of think about the citywide sort of application of architectural style. Um, within uh, Lower Vieira, it's sort of a broader, sort of more um, eclectic uh, composition of styles. Um, here we have a situation where uh, within the guidelines that new structures are actually not required to conform to a particular style, but they're looking for architectural compatibility with these styles. And those include a uh, subset of craftsmen, American craftsmen, uh, national folk, Spanish colonial revival, mission revival, American colonial revival. So we looked at these sort of through that lens, again, to sort of understand what the zoning ordinance was saying about these styles and how these sort of could be brought forward towards sort of a project-wide architectural style strategy. And so we wanna sort of provide this sort of information uh, for you for background today. Go to the next slide, please. So um, we looked at sort of the prevalence of the sort of broader styles. We are honing in on sort of five key styles. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of what we see as sort of the key characteristics of those styles. Um, uh, and uh, I also sort of will talk a little bit about how we see those applying to the geography uh, because uh, we don't see it as sort of a one size fits all uh, or sort of a situation where you would want all styles to be allowed or recommended in all locations based on sort of the existing geography and the prevalence of existing styles within the city. There are also a sort of issues that I'll sort of want to introduce today that have to do with sort of the level of regulation. Uh, what we mean by sort of promoting an architectural style to ensure architectural compatibility uh, versus uh, promoting artificial style that actually might be to actually get sort of a more prescriptive outcome uh, to get something that actually sort of reads and looks and feels exactly like that style because it actually might be important uh, to that specific geography of the city. And I talk a little bit more about that. We sort of want to sort of present this concept in kind of a looser way today for discussion, but we think it's sort of important to think about sort of how we want to regulate things moving forward uh, through the objective design standards. So these five styles that I'm gonna talk about today are American colonial revival, craftsmen, Italian Mediterranean and Spanish colonial revival, which as, as you'll see are sort of prevalent within sort of the core portions of the EPV and then contemporary uh, slash industrial, uh, which uh, do have sort of a specific geography in the city we're anticipating. Let's go to the next slide, please. So we're back to the donut diagram here and we sort of I want to walk you through is that um, this version of the map actually has the, the, the neighborhood geographies overlaid. So you can see those in sort of the black fine line uh, uh, creating those polygons and of course sort of labeled with the names of the, um, of the neighborhood. And what we're locating in each neighborhood here is sort of the recommendation for uh, which styles actually would apply within each neighborhood. And so you'll see that sort of in the most broad sense where we would expect all five of those styles to be allowed or prevalent, you'll see the all styles label where there are sort of a few styles that actually are allowed. You'll see sort of a colored bar uh, where sort of generally three to four of those styles are listed. And you can sort of use the key to sort of understand uh, what the prevalence of those styles would be. For example, if you look in the West Side neighborhoods, you see the prevalence of four styles that includes American colonial revival, craftsmen, Spanish colonial revival, and contemporary. Uh, but you can see in this case that Italian Mediterranean is generally expected to be excluded. Uh, based on the prevalence of the existing architecture in the neighborhood. And uh, where styles are sort of the most limited, you'll see that there's sort of a black outline around that key. And so the two sort of uh, uh, locations that come to mind for that condition are the downtown core of the EPV, where you see Italian Mediterranean and Spanish colonial uh, are prevalent um, in the West uh, Beach area where you see sort of similar uh, context, as well as down in East Mesa, special condition where there's sort of a combination of Italian Mediterranean and American corner revival uh, that are sort of making up that context. So again, this is sort of an idea that we would be sort of presenting 
thinking about the buy right projects, the projects where um, discretionary review uh, would not be possible, uh, we would sort of present architectural standards for these styles by geography that would provide applicants with a range of options to produce a compatible building um, in, in these situations. And understanding that, you know, um, uh, for example, the prevalence of craftsmen in the city is not geographically broad. It's limited to certain geographies and we would sort of want to actually put that forward uh, to where they sort of are compatible. The other thing that I sort of want to mention here is when we're sort of looking at this is that as, as the existing conditions uh, memo outlines, there are conditions where block scaled buildings are prevalent, where we're expecting sort of the built form to come right back to the back of the sidewalk and to include sort of the full build out from lot one to lot line of the building. And that those types of buildings make environments where um, there's a continuous street wall and that sort of certain pedestrian elements and the detail of the ground floor of the building can become more important and more significant because of what they're doing to contribute to the pedestrian realm. In these other areas of the city where we basically see house scale buildings or buildings that actually are, are of footprints that are smaller than that sort of block, full block form form, uh, we understand that what's contributing to the streetscape and the pedestrian experience is not just those elements of the building. It's how the front yard is treated. It's the streetscape and the landscape that actually contributes to that. It's the frontage. And so we probably sort of want to think about those how we're sort of regulating those conditions differently. And that, you know, really in the core of the EPV uh, within the, the downtown and the related districts is where we're seeing a prevalence of those block form buildings. And we might want to think about providing additional architectural regulations that can sort of promote that sort of and continue that high quality pedestrian realm to sort of emerge in those conditions where you don't have sort of the ability to sort of leverage sort of those buffers and sort of those different landscape elements in transitioning development sort of to, uh, to, to the sidewalk. So I want to sort of sort of think about that and sort of just kind of plant that seed now because it comes down to that sort of idea of level of regulation and that potentially there is sort of a greater level of regulation inside the donut, whereas sort of that block scale is, uh, is prevalent and also where there is sort of a has been traditionally a finer grain approach to architectural review, you could say, through the HLC, as opposed to what's happening sort of on the outside of the donut, where sort of greater flexibility or some additional creativity actually might be warranted, um, uh, even in sort of these buy right buildings. I want to sort of plant that seed out sort of really just for discussion and sort of make some suggestions today about sort of how the standards actually sort of might re, um, respond um, to that just, the, just to that notion and sort of the idea that there's different geographies in the city. Go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just sort of talking about sort of what we see as the key characteristics of these styles. Again, these are more kind of sort of a macro approach where we're sort of looking at different elements and trying to sort of uh, create sort of more comprehensive stylistic categories um, that, um, uh, can respond to the presence of sort of what we see um, on the ground um, in the neighborhoods. So we start with American Colonial Revival. Um, here we see buildings uh, that are defined by uh, simple massing with uh, rectilinear uh, main body forms. We see sort of classically proportioned cornices and eaves, although they sort of tend to be more sort of uh, uh, basically detailed than we see in some sort of the higher styles, which is Italian Mediterranean. Um, these buildings have external elements like classically inspired porches that tend to have sort of vertical proportions, sometimes with square columns or sometimes with uh, turned uh, uh, columns with architecturally correct intentures and pediments. Uh, we generally see sort of wide, uh, widely proportioned rectangular windows uh, with true or simulated divided lights uh, with sort of trim and uh, uh, occasionally sort of architecturally correct shutters. Um, and we see a prevalence of wood lap siding um, as sort of an external facade material. Um, these aren't sort of meant to be sort of comprehensive, but we're sort of trying to under understand and drill down to the key characteristics that would be defining each style. Go to the next slide, please. 
Um, these are sort of a few examples of what we see for the American Corn Revival um, in, um, uh, in Santa Barbara neighborhoods. Uh, you can see these include those sort of one and a half story examples where the roof is sort of a prevalent feature of the second story, uh, as well as sort of two story examples as this one on the right. Go to the next slide, please. Um, the next style is the craftsman style. Here we see sort of uh, prevalence for low pitched roofs that generally have deep eaves, exposed rafter tails, and rakes that are supported by uh, deep brackets. Uh, we tend to see horizontally proportioned openings that actually need from assemblies of ganged, vertically proportioned windows and large picture windows. Uh, we tend to see uh, asymmetrical compositions in building masks with wall planes broken by projecting gable ends and projecting and recessed elements um, in larger building forms. Um, external elements like porches are characterized by square or tapered columns that have short proportions with sort of wide bay uh, expressions. And we tend to see a lot of sort of half story elements, including uh, um, uh, low roof lines uh, projected by, uh, excuse me, interrupted by wide dormers that are made by um, assembled uh, ganged windows, as well as accent dormers and gable end roofs uh, co contributing to sort of larger architectural forms. Um, so you go to the next slide, show you some examples, um, endemic in Santa Barbara. You know, you can see everything from sort of the low slung, one story bungalow example um, at the upper left to one and a half and sort of two story forms. You can see how those sort of extend from um, limited dimensions that are house scale to sort of some larger, broader, more rambling forms that can support uh, sort of larger, um, uh, uh, larger building forms. Go to the next slide, please. I'm going to talk about sort of the two sort of uh, Spanish revival related styles. The first one is Italian Mediterranean, which we sort of interpret as sort of a higher uh, version of the Mediterranean style. Um, this style tends to have low pitched tip roofs that are clad in red tile, uh, very formal eaves, uh, architecturally correct, often bracketed uh, and fully composed. Um, we tend to see sort of flat rectilinear wall planes that have vertically proportioned hunched openings uh, that are expressed in stucco walls, generally without trim. Uh, stucco is the primary facade uh, material with uh, some additional attached elements made of stucco, wood, uh, and occasionally steel uh, or metal. Um, and we tend to sort of formal and symmetrical compositions of doors and windows in the style. Um, and these are sort of accented on external elements uh, that are sort of classical in nature with columns and pilasters that are uh, used uh, to call out and accentuate uh, entrances and key openings. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see some examples of the Italian Mediterranean style um, in Santa Barbara and how these are sort of used to articulate what we refer to as block form buildings. And you can see what we mean by sort of some of the asymmetrical uh, uh, um, compositions that are articulated by uh, punched openings. Um, and this is in contrast to sort of the Spanish uh, colonial revival, which I'll sort of talk about next, uh, which tends to be sort of more um, picturesque and asymmetrical in nature. Um, and so in the Spanish colonial revival, we see uh, more low pitched sort of gable end and hipped forms. Again, we see a prevalence of red tile roofs, but the eaves tend to be more open, less classical in nature. Uh, they can actually be articulated with sort of open raptor tails. Um, we still see flat rectangular wall planes that are vertically proportioned with punched openings without trim and the prevalence of stucco, um, but we tend to see sort of a greater use of uh, more decorative elements, um, including uh, tiling at window surrounds and along key elements such as stairs. Um, as I mentioned, eaves and cornices tend to be sort of more minimal and simple, and there's more of a prevalence of sort of ornamental elements that are projecting from the roof line, uh, for example, chimneys. Um, and other kinds of vents. On the next page, you can see some examples that we see in this style. Uh, you can see sort of more kind of the rambling forms that are created, some of the asymmetrical compositions, um, and the sort of more playful approach um, uh, that's sort of um, uh, embedded sort of in the approach to sort of the massing of these buildings. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, some additional examples of Spanish Corner Revival in the city. 
Um, and again, you can see some additional um, articulations some the different examples of these kinds of uh, compositions uh, that we get from the Spanish Corner Revival. So the last one I'm going to talk about is the contemporary industrial style. We have sort of packaged these together with the idea that contemporary is, is probably sort of appropriate in a sort of broader geographical area, while the uh, sort of an industrial expression of that um, is probably sort of key to sort of a few sort of geographic areas in the city um, where there's sort of been a prevalence of, 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 of industrial buildings in the past, um, um, uh, such as sort of in and around the funk zone, for example. Um, what we're trying to sort of define here is, again, something that actually can be compatible with the other styles. So we're looking at sort of a contemporary expression that is articulated or can be expressed by flat roof forms that may have sort of a simple uh, roof lines and simple coping details. Again, a prevalence of rectilinear wall planes with punched openings that can be expressed without um, trim and the prevalence of stucco and sort of potentially panelized facade materials um, as sort of prevalent sort of cladding. Again, with sort of um, external elements in wood or steel that actually might be attached to that for expression. And we're sort of expecting sort of a limited material and color sort of background palette um, that also actually might be arranged and sort of to articulate the difference between ground floors and upper floors in the building uh, or by sort of changing sort of vertical wall planes and sort of introducing vertical uh, materials and elements. On the next page are some examples of what we see as sort of the kind of more contemporary and sort of industrial uh, outcome um, of this um, uh, kind of sort of style. Uh, so these are sort of prevalent, I think. Uh, so you see some examples that are sort of more in the industrial tradition. And I think on the next page, we set some additional examples of more sort of contemporary style. I wanna sort of point out here, uh, sort of prevalence for punched openings and also some of the strategies that actually are shown how materials actually are changed both from sort of ground to first floor but also how they are sort of um, articulated sort of within different wall planes uh, and to sort of create sort of a smaller sort of vertical elements uh, within uh, uh, portions of the facade um, um, uh, or within sort of uh, to articulate sort of architectural bays, for example. Go to the next slide, please. So that sort of provides sort of an overview of the styles and uh, we're sort of happy to kind of discuss and sort of answer some uh, additional questions sort of around that. I wanna sort of just pivot sort of briefly to the schedule. Um, this is sort of the third uh, stakeholder work group meeting. You can see we're sort of right on or sort of a little bit behind schedule. Uh, this sort of parallels with our, uh, um, our efforts to begin sort of drafting uh, the design standards and, uh, and, uh, and workbook uh, with the idea that we would be sort of bringing that content uh, to you for review and discussion in subsequent meetings. And uh, so if you go to the next slide, you can see that there are three additional meetings that we are sort of expecting uh, to review this content with you starting in May. Um, and this would parallel some, uh, um, some public outreach work um, and sort of the drafting and the sort of finalizing of the standards on our end. Uh, to sort of appropriate sort of for more uh, public review um, and discussion um, and, and finalization. So we go to the next slide that will sort of be summarized and sort of what's next. Um, uh, we've, this is again, sort of our third meeting. Uh, we look forward to sort of coming back to you with some additional design standards meetings for five and six. So I'm gonna stop there um, and see if there's sort of any um, questions and comments on that content. I can also sort of talk a little bit more about this idea of finding the appropriate level of regulation in different parts of the city if it's appropriate, um, but wanna look forward to sort of your uh, questions and comments on what I've discussed uh, to date right now. And before we get into that, I just for timekeeping, um, let's see, it's about quarter to 11. So I wanna reserve maybe 10 minutes at the end or so for any public members to, um, give us their comments or questions. Um, but I think we can keep this fairly open and um, you can ask questions or comments on the existing conditions report you got, as well as what Stefan just uh, 
presented. So I will um, uh, open the floor. Richard, it looks like you had your hand up first. I think yeah, you can I, uh, unmute yourself, yeah. I, 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 can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, it, my nature is to uh, go through this stuff in very much detail. And uh, first of all, I wanna compliment uh, Opticos on uh, a wonderful uh, memo uh, and uh, I uh, have some errata that uh, is, you know, particular pages and so forth and some specific questions. But generally, is this memo going to be used as a document and uh, forever a part of uh, the public uh, for con public consumption and therefore these errata should be uh, looked at or at least privately uh, given to you to, to work out? Or is this just a tool for us so we don't need to focus in on all that uh, little stuff? Um, I'll, I'll just start on that. Just, um, you know, we've already posted the memo for public, um, you know, the public can see it now, basically it's on our website and we weren't anticipating a lot of changes to it, but if there's a few things, um, you know, maybe you could send to me if there's things that need correcting or, um, you know, if it's fairly minor, I I'm sure we can accommodate that, but we weren't planning any, you know, okay, major. So, so it won't be a permanent part of the guidelines, the memo. I think, and maybe Opticos can weigh in, to me it was sort of background information that will guide them uh, to the design standards themselves. Um, it looks like Stefan is nodding. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that, so I won't, uh, I, I won't uh, bother us with the, the details that I found. Um, One of the interesting things, well, I, I think we have yet to discuss the strategies and I find that very interesting. Uh, but um, one idea, this the zoning envelope studies, um, is there a way, you know, my idea was, um, could it could or should an applicant be required to do something similar? And if um, his real his proposed project is uh, over a certain percentage of the allowable envelope, then more detailed, uh, review would be required, kind of a trigger type of thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so the, 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 the envelope versus actually built is a very good um, image and tool to, to uh, see what's possible rather than what is, see what's actually built rather than what's possible, but could we use that as a, as a required tool to, uh, uh, if, you know, if uh, the, the uh, actual footprint or section or volume that's proposed is real close to the possible envelope, then more review would be required. I think I, I can try to respond to that, Richard. Um, and, you know, Tony, please feel free to sort of jump in here, but one of the key things that we were trying to sort of understand through that exercise is 
how we could define transitional standards where there are uh, control issues of scale between proposed projects and adjacent projects. And if there are sort of any additional standards that could actually be developed to replace what happens during the sort of discretionary review process, particularly thinking about these by right projects that sort of wouldn't have the sort of benefit of going through that process. Right. Um, Tony, do you feel like there's anything to add there that you want to sort of try to articulate? Hey, Tony, did you nod your head no? Oh, sorry, I was nodding. I, yeah, I missed that. Yeah, it's okay. It. <laughs> you just weren't up on my screen, so. So that's how we're sort of thinking about that, Richard. You know, that we're still conceptualizing that the odds are significant and important for these specific situations where we will no longer have the benefit of the discretionary review process. Right, right. Okay. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, certainly. I, uh, I have a couple of questions and all I'm going to do at this point is list them all because I don't think they can be answered in the confines of a single meeting, but I think it's important that they be answered at some point. And they deal with architectural style, and this is for Opticos. Is there a legal or regulatory definition of style or of particular styles at the state level because we're dealing with a state mandate? Also, in terms of defining the styles, I think that uh, for the craftsman, for example, you use the phrase and or. I think that you'll find it's very difficult to use in a regulatory sense. So I might suggest that you think of a strategy which has craftsmen and then subcategories of craftsmen. That is the way, for example, Virginia McAllister handles it in the field guide to American homes. Uh, also, it seems like there's a lot of overlap between Spanish colonial revival and uh, classical. If you look at the first three definitions, the first three bullet items, and I think it needs to be, we need to be careful that we can make a clear distinction between styles, that there's not so much overlap that it becomes difficult to figure out what's what. The uh, last question I have deals with the contemporary and industrial and you use the phrase flat rectilinear, uh, in which I, that language suggests no curves. And I think that there's a lot of industrial or, or contemporary that has a deco flavor that would use curved forms. And if you mean there's no curves possible, then that's fine. If you mean that there could be forms that have a curve, then that language needs to be revisited. Those are my questions now. Thanks, Dennis. Those are fantastic questions um, and comments, and uh, there's a lot to chew on there. I could say quickly that with regards to the sort of legal or regulatory definition of style at the state level, we don't have one. Um, so, you know, that gives us an opportunity to define something here. I think that with regards to the intent and the description of the styles, I, um, I appreciate your comment about needing to be specific and uh, going down to another level where it's necessary in order to sort of define that specificity. Um, one of the things that we sort of wanna do is think about sort of a qualitative intent for the styles, which is closer to sort of what we presented today and sort of the, the regulatory outcome, which needs would actually be defined as specific dimensioned regulations for different elements of, of the building that if used and assembled would could be seen as sort of meeting that qualitative intent that I described. And that's something that um, we will want to bring to you for discussion to sort of talk through um, once we actually sort of produce that work. Um, because in some situations, uh, you could be in a funnel where you are applying uh, one detail for different portions of the building and then you have an outcome at the bottom 
in other situations, you actually may have options and you actually, you know, you could have two or three Eve details to choose from and the regulations are saying, you need to do at least one, uh, but you need to do one of these. And that's sort of, a, that's an important consideration, particularly when you are trying to um, differentiate uh, styles between styles that are related as they're sort of described in the field guide, for example. So I, I really appreciate those, all of those comments. Thanks. So I have, a, I have a question on uh, the styles. Um, first of all, Italianate is a subcategory of, this is a question, a subcategory of Victorian. Is, and I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the term Italianate is, 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 is used in two different contexts uh, in Santa Barbara. One is referring to sort of predominantly uh, uh, the Italianate style, which is, you know, sort of uh, late 19th century, primarily sort of wood expression that is sort of a, you know, could be described as sort of a higher version of sort of the folk Victorian. Um, uh, we see a lot of fantastic examples in, in Santa Barbara and in, in other cities in, in California. And then we also use the term Italianate to describe Italianate Mediterranean, which is something that's endemic to the El Pueblo Viejo and is representative of sort of a more classical version of the Spanish Revival. Uh, the Spanish Revival style that is sort of expressed with uh, more uh, architecturally correct uh, classical detailing uh, yeah, in proportion, for example. So, you know, in the context of you're talking about Brinkerhoff, for example, Italian aid is used more in sort of the former context. We're talking about it here in more of the latter context. The the Italian Mediterranean. Mediterranean. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it seems to me that a lot uh, there's a lot of Italian aid. Victorian in town and part of your uh, menu doesn't include that style and I wondered what the how you got there. Uh, that's a great is that, question. Is that, I, I, is I'm, that wondering, a, I'm wondering. That's a Sorry, reasonable question. That's a reasonable question, correct? <laughs> yeah, and you know, Eric, if you would be willing to chime in here and talk a little bit about sort of the process that we've gone through to take the large umbrella of styles and reduce it down to something that actually sort of is more feasible for what we can actually do through this project. Could you say a few words about that, Eric, for Richard's benefit? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so we're scoped to do um, or to take five styles and, and apply objective design standards to those. And so in the process of uh, our observations to d develop the existing conditions memo, we um, created style groups. Um, and if you recall in that PDF, we have four style groups. And um, they're consolidated by, in a way, families. Um, so Victorian and uh, Italianate and things similar to Victorian were actually uh, kind of in their own style group that we uh, didn't take forward into this uh, process of, of observing existing conditions. So that's mm -hmm. kind of where the drop off was to begin with. And then um, moving forward in the process after that, we uh, took those style groups and then uh, consolid consolidated them further um, to five styles that you're we presented today. Um, and for those five style, <coughs> sorry, for those five styles, we uh, we're running with the logic that which are truly iconic to Santa Barbara, and then if not iconic, uh, representative at a glance to someone who's visiting Santa Barbara, and that's how we landed up the five styles that we currently have. Um, so that's kind of the workflow we did and where, <coughs> sorry, where Victorian and kind of a Victorian family, including Italianate, um, fell off uh, uh, in the so, styles. 
so if so if uh, an applicant has a Victorian Italianate whatever project, he doesn't have any. He wouldn't have any guidelines to see if his addition or his uh, neighboring project or related closely related project uh, would look like or could, or could look like guidelines to help him develop. So Richard, are you referring to, um, let's say there's a new building, multi, you know, residential building and they wanna do sort of Italianate style, Italianate slash Victorian? Well, um, e either that or uh, if, uh, you know, if there was a portion of a project already Italianate or Victorian that wanted more new development or in addition to, you know, where, where does he find his guidelines? Right, so we have, um, as you know, multiple guidelines in the city already, um, especially um, for historic styles, um, you know, we have those historic resource guidelines. Now, as moving forward with standards, projects will be sort of uh, reviewed against a checklist of design standards. And like we said, for these five styles, uh, we're still sort of working out details on how this is gonna work when um, in the future, if somebody wants to propose something that doesn't conform to the standards, what do they do? Yeah. And um, what may be possible is they opt out of sort of the quick ministerial checklist process and they go through our normal or the process we're using now where there's um, review by design review boards and projects conform to our already written design guidelines in the city. Uh -huh. So it's not that you couldn't propose something different from these five um, potential standards. It's just, um, you might be in a different process. Okay, well, yeah, that, tips on the, the bigger question here when we get to the strategies of, you know, limiting the styles, but I'll wait until we're into that. Uh, and I also want to mention just for the benefit of the group, you know, like, like um, Eric mentioned, when we scoped this project and um, put out an RFP, we did say, you know, we wanted up to five styles. And that was, you know, based on the amount of money we have and the timeline we're on and this is funded by a grant that seemed reasonable. Um, that doesn't mean the city wouldn't find later on, you know, really we need more standards for more styles. This isn't working. You know, there, there could be follow on efforts okay. to expand this yeah. in the future. I'm not, I'm not critical. I'm just questioning why. So I see some hands up and we haven't heard from, um, Cassandra or John yet. So um, I didn't see the order they came up in, but um, do you want to go next, John, and then Cassandra? And then Dennis is after that, if you still have your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, this, the, Richard uh, mentioned a, a comment I actually had on the written document, which is on page 71. And I was asked, they're going to ask for an explanation of the discussion regarding other styles on page 71 regarding Victorian, because it seems like it's being excluded and I wasn't sure why it was being excluded. Is it just because of this contract uh, limit of five? Because there are areas which Victorian would count, especially any area which Tudor is allowed. I, I just don't understand the logic of Victorian wouldn't be also allowed. So. That's the question I had. And then I had another question, which is goes back to Mrs. Wally, one for you, Rosie, which is I was looking at the project area map, and there's a bunch of areas in which are excluded within the core. One is the Paseo, the county courthouse, but there's a whole bunch of other random parcels that are excluded. Could you explain what those are and why they're excluded? So those are the two questions, the comments I have. I can start with the first question and then I, I 
can also try to respond to the second question. That's helpful. Um, no, I think uh, one of the things that we discussed internally with the Victorian style is when we were sort of narrowing things down to those five styles, we were looking to sort of optimize or maximize the applicability to the full range of built form that we were expecting. And Victorian is, is something that is, for example, in Santa Barbara is actually largely prevalent within sort of a sort of a small scaled single family scale, but it hasn't necessarily translated to uh, the prevalence of larger buildings. And what we're sort of looking at here are environments that are predominantly multifamily and mixed use residential, most of which are needing to sort of provide building forms that are up to three and a half stories tall, um, it could potentially be sort of fairly large. So the decision was made to say, although that is sort of something that actually is seen, it is not necessarily sort of the best style to produce new buildings within that context and that environment. And that was sort of a position that sort of the team and staff sort of took together. There were some other styles that were sort of shook out as well, um, based on sort of some of the same issues, for example, Tudor, um, uh, because it, it's, it's not seen as something that actually has historically ever translated to larger scale buildings, um, which we will need to regulate in these environments in the city. Um, and then I think uh, to the second question, the holes in the map that you describe are actually related to, uh, to zoning um, uh, because the odds are basically only applicable in uh, multifamily and mixed use environments where residential uh, is, is an allowed use. And so that's the, ge the geography that you see is sort of re is related to that. So in institutional zones uh, or other zones, uh, commercial zones that are solely commercial where residential is not allowed, uh, the, the odds actually would not apply right now um, uh, to those zones. Okay, a question. That's, for, that's why you see some holes in the map. Yeah, yeah a, a question, Rosie. If somebody wanted to do a, a general plan amendment or a zone change to change them to multifamily categories, how would these standards apply or would they not apply at all? Let's see. So if they processed a um, yeah, general plan and zoning amendment change, then um, I think the way we will sort of apply these standards as they apply to anywhere zone that allows three or more units. So if they go through the zone change and they're allowed three or more units, then the standards would apply. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Cass, you're next. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. And uh, sorry I was a, a few minutes late getting here, but um, I'm uh, Cass Ansberg, uh, architect, been here in Santa Barbara for over 30 years. Um, I always, uh, well, for, well, first of all, uh, appreciate all the work, just want to make that clear up front. Um, I always uh, like to sort of step back and take a big view of things and just kind of remember um, what the purpose is of what we're doing and just kind of big picture. And I think that um, I'm always very interested in uh, creativity and the art aspect of things and how we um, are, what I believe what we're trying to do is to create these uh, standards uh, so that our other neighborhoods, so that each neighborhood be can, can become more uh, unique and magnified in terms of its uh, personality. And, um, uh, you mentioned that, you know, a lot of these styles were selected, uh, I think something I probably got this wrong, but something to, along the lines of what, what a visitor would see when they would come to Santa Barbara. And there's a lot of things that the visitor wouldn't necessarily see. Uh, there's a lot of really creative, unique um, uh, examples of all of these styles that are um, kind of hidden from view, or if you don't know they're there, you wouldn't necessarily know. It's more something that a local would know, like, oh, what about this building and this building that are also uh, representative of any one of these styles. So I think that's important to um, get that local knowledge. Um, I, I, the example I like to give, you know, the whole reason that we uh, embarked on this uh, journey was because uh, we had to create 
standards uh, for SB 35. And we picked the um, uh, Spanish colonial revival style because it is uh, in the El Pueblo Viejo, which is our you know, main um, you know, important part of town. El Pueblo Viejo is uh, the thing. And um, to, for lack of a better way of saying it, and um, that, and the style of the um, Spanish colonial revival is one that you're going to find a lot of uh, support for. It's something we all really love. So that was the standard that was created, but we immediately, uh, many of us said, hey, you know, we need to have other standards because we don't want to dilute the, um, the power of EPV by having um, Spanish colonial revival throughout the entire city. We want EPV to be, remain special and to be unique. And we want the other neighborhoods to have their own uniqueness as well. So that's why we said, hey, we got to do this. So that's why we're doing it, I believe. Um, I, I want to say that um, I remember in one of the earlier um, meetings, you had the, another style that was the outlier. And that one was sort of this uh, creative, it, I, I remember there were a couple of, um, you know, our good friend uh, Jeff Shelton's projects that are uh, sort of a Spanish colonial revival, um, Dr. Seuss mix somehow. Um, so I, I really, I think the trick is, um, and, and I think the whole zoning thing, that's a separate discussion. This is talking in my mind about the style and how that style, and that style could be any number of uh, any number of sizes. You know, the size, bulk, and scale can be applied to any one of these these styles to to a great degree. So I, um, how do we get standard? And we can determine the standard if we want to say, okay, this is this is a, a, a craftsman. We can say of the craft, which is exactly what we did on the standards uh, on the standards for the Spanish colonial revival, we picked out all of our favorite, favorite, favorite um, details from that and we put those in. So we can do that same thing with all of these. It doesn't have to be by some book somewhere. It can be our community agreed um, assemblage of this particular style that would say if it's craftsmen, um, that would um, encourage cre the creative, the creativity. So we just don't end up with these cookie cutter things. We end up with a craftsman that's unique somehow. And um, that's what I would like to, to just put out there to think about um, so that when someone's coming through, so we're streamlining the process. So if somebody's coming through the design review process and they have something we don't want to stifle the creativity that they come through that they could get ministerially uh, uh, approved um, unless they go really far afield well then they're going to have to go through more extensive review um, and then I just and that's all I'll say because I don't want to take up too much time uh, but I do also agree with what others have said about other styles you know the Tudor the Victorian deco I'd like to see more in terms of contemporary possibilities and I think that um, some of us uh, could, you know, uh, provide some examples of those that maybe um, aren't fully apparent uh, unless you live here. So I'll, I'll just stop there and I, I hope that maybe can add to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cass. And yeah, I think um, one of the things I wanted to talk about the work group about today, you know, the, the five styles Opticos has promoted so far, sort of see, do you, do you agree these styles need standards and are there others that they haven't captured and, and what should we, how should we accommodate that? So, um, so that's good input. And I'm wondering, is there any other um, work group member? I see Robert Dooley or Daddy, do you, do you want to chime in? at this point before we um, leave a little time for public comment. Thanks, Rosie. Um, but no, it's a great discussion and I don't have anything unique to add to what others have already said. Okay, 
Um, Daddy? Yeah, just, yes, thank you, um, Rosie. Uh, yeah, I feel the same way. I think a lot of uh, really uh, good things have been said so far. Uh, I mean, you know, Cass kind of put her finger on a lot of my concerns, which are that, you know, we, we, we certainly want these objective standards to make the, the review process for, you know, any given project uh, much more um, predictable, shall we say, and streamlined. And that, I think, is the, the intention of the state uh, in, an, in, in kind of pushing this direction to create these standards, et cetera. So, and I understand the idea that, uh, you know, not every project is going to fit in with these standards and they can still have the option to go through the standard review process. But if they want that more streamlined process, then they, they would have to select one of these styles. My main concern about the styles identified, and I understand that you can't cover every single style, but I was concerned about the um, characterization and description of the contemporary style because contemporary style by nature is dynamic. It's ever changing with trends, technologies, et cetera, uh, and aesthetic considerations. And to simply sort of, I felt it was kind of pigeonholed to say that it was uh, contemporary, industrial, et cetera, which I think, uh, you know, creates, um, I guess, kind of either forces uh, contemporary expressions into a particular direction and doesn't seem to uh, accommodate a, a broader definition of what a contemporary style is and particularly when it comes to um, you know a more um, serendipitous type of style or, or something that is more artistic in character etc <laughs> as Cass alluded so I really would like to see a, personally a, a broader definition of what we mean by contemporary uh, and those areas of the community where um, the contemporary style of architecture would be appropriate, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy. And, and I have a question I kind of want to throw out to the work group members. Um, as you know, we, we discussed five styles and we also have a map uh, from Opticos where they've um, looked at areas of the city where we may want to consider um, either allowing all styles or limiting styles. And I think I would really like your input on that map. And I know we don't have a lot of time today to delve into it. Um, what I'm wondering is if it would be helpful if we facilitated a, a, another work group meeting to just talk about that. And it would be more staff driven at this point, because again, under our contract with Opticus, we we have a limited number of work group meetings, but we could meet with you again in say a couple of weeks and, and just look at that in more detail. Another option is you just look at the map and kind of give me your input and we could do it without holding a meeting. But um, I wanna throw that out there and see if you have uh, interest in either meeting again or giving me more input on that map. Um, before Opticos kind of moves on to the next step. Um, so Dennis, do you, you need to unmute Dennis? Sorry, uh, a quick, just a quick comment. Um, I think another local meeting might be helpful, but also I think one goal for the Opticus project would be to work with those five styles in a way that it gives us locally a template for future additions to it. And by template, I mean a definition of style that would address the material palette, the roof forms, the fenestration patterns, and provide local paradigms. And I think that the five, the, the initial attempts at defining those five styles is the beginning of a template that could then be expanded down the road as we, as locally, we deem proper or necessary. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's good input. And I see some nodding heads, so that sounds good. Okay, Cass? Um, yeah, I, I agree. And I, uh, I would like very much to have a meeting together where we can just, you know, really continue. I think that's a lot, you know, it's better collaboratively than each of us writing in. I, I, would, I would very much support that. Okay, um, Robert. 
Um, I also agree that uh, a local meeting would be beneficial, but it would seem also to me that whatever the five styles are, uh, uh, they should be, term be determined by what the majority of styles in the city are, not just a random list of styles. So based on the survey work, uh, you know, Victorian is the top getter, you know, Spanish is the top, whatever they are, and take the top five majority of buildings in town, and that's what these standards would cover. And that leaves the unique ones to be a case by case situation. So, Again, did you want to say something? It looks like uh, uh, just a just a comment on Mr. Uli's um, statement. Um, so one thing that we would want to do with standards is look at what the demand is for different types of styles now because we don't see a lot of new victorians we don't see a lot of new american colonial revival so so what's the demand for the design market and what it what's the forecast for that now because the five styles we pick right now um should should fall within that and then we can broaden from there it won't be perfect but um that's just what i wanted to add Okay, any other, um, and I want to leave a little time for the public in case they want to um, Bruce, say anything, but any Bruce, So one thing I uh, don't quite understand, or I think the crux of the thing is, you know, that by limiting the styles allowed in each one of these districts or neighborhoods, you know, the more restrictive is, Am I to understand that if you choose a style that's not allowed in that neighborhood, you have to go through the full design process? Is that is that what this is coming to? It it might head in that direction. We don't know yet. Um, it, it would it would seem to me that if you but, you, you can say that only one or two styles are allowed and then we're back to you know the uh and a more discretionary review and we're you know we we've uh not uh accomplished our goal of streamlining right that's a, a good point and we could so where is so where is the balance between you know letting all styles go through uh in a streamlined sense and having extreme limits to the number of styles and therefore having a lot of projects that want other styles go through the the uh, discretionary process which we're trying to uh, streamline And when, when does when does the state say, hey, wait a minute, you've, re, you've restricted this so far that this is really not uh, what you're supposed to be doing? Right. There, those are all good points, and I don't have the answers right now, but um, we want to keep that in mind as we're looking at neighborhoods. I mean, the what we're trying to achieve is a balance between, you know, being um, open-ended completely and that sort of hard to define neighborhood compatibility. And there are potentially certain neighborhoods in the city where if we want new buildings to meet neighborhood compatibility, maybe they do need to be in a certain style. I, I don't have the answers right now, but that could be the conclusion. Or we could decide as a group and as a city outside of El Pueblo Viejo, it could be anything goes like we don't have to restrict these other neighborhoods it's just an idea at this point um ultimately it'll be up to whatever city council adopts in the end um so those are things to to think about for sure just just one point before you uh go on it there's it looked like uh, i counted the lots that are over 50 by 100 there's only about 33 in the whole city that are greater than 50 by 100 that were concerned about having large-scale projects on so kind of puts a 
context on the magnitude of our uh, issue. That's a good point. Although sometimes people do buy um, multiple lots and combine them. But yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, let's see, I may need to check with Timmy Bolden, but if someone from the public wants to speak to me, can they just raise their hand at this point? Yep, you could go through it like that and then you'll be able to unmute them. Okay, so um, it looks like we have a, a few members of the public. If you want to speak, go ahead and raise your hand and then I can unmute you. Let's see. I don't see any raised hands. Oh, maybe I do. No? It looked like a raised hand, but then it went away. Do you know, Timmy, if that's uh Yeah, it looked like Mr. Sweeney was raising his hands. Um, might suggest for any attendees wanting to speak to keep your hand raised, don't lower it after you raise it. Here, Mr. Sweeney, I think I allow, uh, okay. gave you talking privilege. There you go. Thank you. I assume you all can hear me. And uh, just to start off, uh, thank you, Opticos, for uh, a well put together presentation, and I've got a copy of the stylistic book uh, report. Um, we are finally, as a city, touching our toes into form-based planning, which I've been harping at for years, so we're almost there. I want to cover four points fairly quickly. One is uh, no discrete and architectural style. Two is the idea of shade and sun along State Street. Three is the view corridors to the mountains. And four is the current AUD process. And let me start with the, the view to the mountains. And Rosie, you have, a, you have an image behind you that says it all. Um, why is Santa Barbara so special uh, versus, say, Ventura or Pismo Beach or Hermosa Beach or Manhattan Beach? It's because we can see those mountains. And so you're... you're uh, as you proceed, think about the walled corridors that cross State Street, because one of the most enjoyable things for visitors is to be able to walk up and down State Street and at every street opening, be able to look back towards those mountains. And if we continue to create walled corridors uh, on Coda Street or De La Guerra or wherever, we're gonna lose that image. And so we have to be very careful and that's why I'm so much uh, looking forward to the form-based issues of setbacks and et cetera, particularly on projects that have to go lot line to lot line. The other thing about State Street is the shade and sun. For those of us who've been here a while, we can remember back when retail really dominated State Street. It'll never, probably will never be that way again. But in those days, the higher end stores were on the shade side. That's the freeway 101 side or the Mesa side of State Street. Uh, because of the way the sun travels across the city. And so if we allow um, the, the same height of buildings on both sides of the State Street, we're gonna lose some of that, that process. If we allow high side, high, high uh, story buildings on the mountainside, then we have the, the opportunity to close off those mountain views. So I think, again, that's gonna be very important because it's going to be in the details of these design standards. Um, second is the, the AUD. The, there is an ordinance that supposedly went into, or, into effect yesterday, and it's in, it's in juxtaposition to what you're talking about, particularly along the map that Rosie uh, pointed out to, uh, particularly in the area on the mountainside of State Street between Arriaga and Mission, where it's where the map sits right next to one and two story residential zones. And that happens on many other occasions on that map. So when you have your meeting on the map, you need to think about the height of three and four story buildings that could be allowed under AUD ordinance and what it will look like against those two story and one story residential zones. Um, then Haley Milpas. Milpas Street, I think, in my opinion, is a very special place and will be the thrust 
of major future development because of land costs are cheaper there than on State Street. And the Italian 8 style you all talked about, I'm not sure that's the one. Uh, you look at styles there, it's a very simplified version of things that we find in Mexico, that we find in the Southwest, where it's simple post and beam, stucco, not so much punched openings because that costs money. Uh, and so I think one really needs to look at that. There's something called the uh, Haley Milpas Design Manual that was developed in 1982. I don't know if that's still in use by the city. Um, I've encouraged that whole document to be either thrown out or revisited, but it sounds like some of the work you're going to do is going to be affecting that document if it's still in use. But I would urge Opticos to take a look at that because it does say a lot about the Milpa Street area, which I think some, needs some very special and tender loving care. So um, I hope I made that short enough. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Anyone else um, in the public want to raise their hand? Okay, I'm not seeing any and we're almost on time. Um, so, I will be in touch with the work group again about um, maybe meeting again to talk a little bit more about the architectural styles and, and the map of where the styles would potentially um, be limited or not. I think that would be a good um, continued discussion um, before we get um, too far along. And I'll, I'll try to schedule that um, not too far in the future. And um, I'll ask if Opticos has any last words they want to say before we conclude. I don't, but I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining the presentation today and uh, very helpful comments and thoughts on the content. So it's very much appreciated. Yes, thank you for your time. The meeting was uh, recorded, so we will be posting it and um, we'll see you all soon. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you.